Welcome everyone for another session in this symposium. I'm Japjan Bolens. I'm the Chief of Transplant and Cellular Therapies at MSK, New York City. First of all, I would like to thank um, Alicia for inviting me and also, con uh, let's say, and also congratulate her with this fantastic lineup of this symposium. And it's really impressive to see that between 250 and 300 attendees are joining the various sessions so far. I'm really excited to moderate this session on immune reconstitution. As most of you know, I have a um, deep interest to individualize the conditioning regimens to get to a better predictable immune reconstitution, because I believe this is the driver of the outcomes after transplant. And of course, first of all, to make it a safe platform. And Jurgen already mentioned fludarabine and ATG, that that can have an impact on the immune constitution after. Because in these platforms where we only infuse a small amount of T cells, we really need, need to take good care of these cells. So again, I'm looking forward. We have an excellent lineup in the upcoming almost two hours. We have three speakers and we will take the questions after these three presentations. So don't hesitate audience to post the various questions in the Q&A box. So it's a great pleasure to introduce to you the first speaker, Susan Prokop. She is currently the head of clinical research at MSK. Uh, unfortunately, she is leaving in about two weeks, and her first talk of this session will be on immune reconstitution after T depleted haplotransplant. Susan, floor is yours. Thank you, Yap, and thank you to the organizers for putting together this exciting meeting. Here are my disclosures, but among my disclosures is also that um, most of what I'll be talking about is in the setting of T-cell depleted transplant, but not necessarily specifically uh, the alpha beta platform. Um, so really, I think increasingly um, the unmet needs of transplant, both from toxicity, from the non-relapse morbidity associated with infection reactivation, and graft versus host disease, as well as disease recurrence, can all be modified um, with immune reconstitution. And so it underscores the importance of immune reconstitution. And this schema really just is a reminder of the pace of immune reconstitution. And um, in this setting, especially of a T cell depleted, either ex vivo or in vivo T cell depleted graft. The idea that the CD4 reconstitution is really the last and latest um, definitive component of immune reconstitution in most platforms in most settings. And when we think about T cell reconstitution, there are really two pools that contribute to T cell reconstitution. The first being precursor T cells that migrate to the thymus and mature and take up and become the repertoire with a fully responsive repertoire. And um, the second is the memory T cells infused at the time of transplant um, that undergo peripheral expansion. And frequently this results in a skewed repertoire or limited responses to some infections. And the other source that's um, increasingly important in the setting of a T cell depleted transplant is residual recipient T cells. Um, and in this setting, again, you have the precursors that can migrate to the thymus and develop into a naive full repertoire, although typically at a delayed time point. And peripheral expansion really depends on potentially residual T cells or the few T cells administered with the graft. And we've known um, for more than 20 years now that um, the immune reconstitution following T cell depleted hematopoietic transplant, and most of the data in this, in this paper was generated actually with um, SBA negative, E negative, uh, bone marrow grafts, but the, 
that the immune reconstitution that follows T cell depleted transplant can be quite lengthy, especially as you can see in the upper panels in adults. And that while in children, the immune reconstitution, the pace of immune reconstitution is similar after a matched as it is after a mismatched T depleted transplant. In the adults on the top right corner, you can see that after a mismatched transplant, the CD4 immune reconstitution is significantly delayed, even compared to the delayed reconstitution in the match setting. And in this paper, Dr. Small also showed that the patients who had lethal infections were, were significantly in the lower quadrants of these panels, having the poorest of immune reconstitution. And so when we fast forward into more modern papers, um, as Dr. Kubel showed this morning, there's um, not a consistent uh, presentation in terms of how the data of immune reconstitution after ex vivo alpha beta CD19 depleted transplant happened. But you can see that the early NK reconstitution is very prominent along with the gamma delta reconstitution that wanes. And that by six months after transplant, the majority of these patients have developed uh, CD4 beauty immunity with a median of 264 CD4 C cells by six months post-transplant, and with relatively, compared to that old historical data, more rapid reconstitution of even um, the, the memory, the naive populations. And, and this more recent publication, looking at the role of zanidronate in trying to improve reconstitution also demonstrates this early, and really what I'm trying to show here is the early impressive component of gamma delta T cells that has helped move this, this approach to the forefront of our T cell depleted platforms. But when we think about the timing to, to viral control and, and good T cell reconstitution, you can still see this is a very small study with just 12 um, recipients. But what you can see from this is that the um, time to a diverse clonal, clonally diverse population of T cells is still delayed. And that at an early time point of 60 days post transplant, T cell diversity actually depended in these patients with higher diversity on host rather than donor derived T cells. And that the donor component of alpha beta T cells had a very skewed diversity. And, and to be a little even handed here in the post transplant cyclophosphamide setting, we can also see that the early NK expansion that we see after other platforms of T cell depletion is blunted. And this um, delayed time to CD4 and even more uh, significantly CD8 reconstitution. And I think this slide, as Dr. Kobel showed this morning, really depicts the varied um, assessments of immune reconstitution after these platforms. And so what I'm going to focus on today is really how we can transition to looking at consistent milestones of immune reconstitution and how we can look at earlier milestones, not as an example of how we have failed in patients who've already developed severe infections, for instance, but how we might be able to pivot to improving outcomes for more of our patients. And so moving sort of sequentially back from that one year time point, this paper looked at reconstitution at six months as predictive of outcomes, of long term outcomes, including overall survival, and identified in the setting of alumtuzumab based T cell depletion, identified an absolute lymphocyte count, as well as CD8 T cells as important. And 
In the uh, memorial experience, looking again predominantly at an adult population of patients who underwent T vivo T cell depletion. And a landmark analysis of CD4 as well as PHA reconstitution at six months demonstrated that those recipients who had robust CD4 and PHA and functional assay of those CD4 T cells had markedly improved overall survival as well as event-free survival compared to those who did not. And moving it back a little farther, so this, um, this manuscript is not an example of a T cell depleted platform, but was able to look at 100 days after transplant, so moving the time frame back a little bit, and looked across um, the three different uh, graft sources of core blood, bone marrow, and peripheral blood stem cell. And they were able to identify that there were specific compartments that predicted overall survival, as well as non-relapse survival, relapse, and chronic graft versus host disease. What these authors did not do, and, and I think an important next step in our understanding of how we can use data like this to move the field forward, is to identify a true threshold within each of these compartments. And so, as I think most of this audience knows, yep, Mamboland, um, yep, Jan Boland, when he was in the Netherlands, had identified the early CD4 immune reconstitution defined mm -hmm. as having a CD4 of greater than 50 by day 100 on two consecutive measurements as a validated milestone of immune reconstitution and demonstrated in a large cohort of pediatric transplant recipients in the Netherlands that those with successful immune reconstitution had significantly um, improved overall survival. And so when he came to MSK, we performed this same analysis on a cohort of patients treated over a 10 year period with um, dense immune reconstitution data available. And we're able to mirror this finding with 75% overall survival in those with um, robust CD4, early CD4 reconstitution compared to those without. And importantly, the MSKCC cohort includes a significant portion of patients who'd undergone T cell depleted transplantation. And in both cohorts, what we see is that the significant difference in overall survival is largely driven by a difference in non-relapse mortality. So in both cohorts, the non-relapse mortality in those who do not achieve CD4 immune reconstitution at day 100 is 30%. So at MSK, as I mentioned, because of the large number of pediatric patients who'd undergone a T cell depleted transplant in this cohort, we were able to do a subset analysis and looked at overall survival specifically in those recipients who'd had a T cell depleted transplant and found the same signal, improved overall survival as well as inferior non-relapse mortality. So non-relapse mortality in those who had reconstituted CD4 T cells by day 100 of just 4.3% compared to 30% in those who had not. And again, the non-relapse mortality in this setting is largely driven in it by infection. And so the group in the Netherlands had gone on to look at the outcome of patients who reactivated virus. And so this isn't about necessarily not reacting virus, but it's, this analysis is more about if, if and when you reactivate one of these viruses, how do you fare? And so what they were able to identify very clearly was that non-relapse mortality in those who activated, reactivated virus without CD4 immune reconstitution was 54%, while those who reactivated adenovirus at the same time as having reconstituted their T cells essentially had no statistically different survival than those who did not reactivate adenovirus. 
And so what are the predictors of early CD4 reconstitution? And so in the memorial cohort, we were able to identify, not, not surprisingly, that T cell depleted transplants recipients and T depleted transplant recipients were at an inferior, had an inferior cumulative incidence of CD4 immune reconstitution. And then the median age threat off threshold of 10.15 also um, demonstrated a difference in cumulative incidence of CD4 reconstitution. But those are typically not um, as modifiable. So uh, somebody either undergoes T cell depleted transplantation or they do not, and we can't change their age. But there are modifiable components to this. And so Again, as had been previously shown, exposure to ATG is critically important in terms of the reconstitution of CD4 immunity. And really what we're talking about is exposure of ATG at the time of the infusion of the stem cell graft. And this had been demonstrated in the setting of conventional transplant. But and this is one example of that where ATG exposure in this adult population undergoing non-myeloplative transplant was demonstrated to be associated with overall survival as well as non-relapse and relapse-related mortality. But can we look at those same components of CD4 reconstitution in the setting of a T-cell depleted transplant? And so with this, um, this is really all um, data generated at Memorial by, uh, led by Madhvi Lakaraja and Mike Scordo um, with the mentorship of Jack, Jack Bolins. And, um, and so these are all patients who underwent uh, primarily CD34 selected T cell depleted hematopoietic transplant and uh, transplanted in this 10 year period. And so, uh, the exposure to ATG at the time of transplant was extrapolated from or simulated based on the ALC and the patient weight at the time of infusion. And the modeling was done on the Insight platform with a demonstration here of what that looked like. And so in the pediatric population, Dr. Lakaraja was able to demonstrate that a significant proportion of patients had exposure of ATG um, that, that decreased the incidence of CD4 reconstitution. And so those with exposure of ATG over an AUC of about 20 were less likely to reconstitute CD4s by day 100. And when divided into those who had low exposure, less than 20 or no ATG, and those who had a higher exposure, you could see that the cumulative incidence of CD4 reconstitution was significantly decreased. And this correlated with both non-relapse mortality as well as overall survival. And again, this is all based on simulated exposure to ATG. And so, and while only a third of these pediatric patients had exposure to ATG that was in the favorable range, you could again see this very impressive difference in overall survival, largely driven by non-relapse mortality. And so then uh, with Dr. Scordo, this same exercise was performed on a large cohort of pediatric and adult transplant recipients. And in this instance, the threshold for ATG exposure was determined to be closer to 30 and set at 30. And so, and we could see um, improved non-relapse mortality as well as overall survival in, in those patients with lower exposure. When this was then categorized as exposure less than 30, 30 to 50, and greater than 35, you saw stratification of these results 
across these three different exposure levels. So CD4 immune reconstitution, non-relapse mortality, and overall survival were most impressive in those with the lowest exposure to ATG, intermediate in this group, and significantly inferior in the overexposed or greater than 55. And again, in this large cohort of patients undergoing T cell depleted transplantation, what you saw was that those who achieved CD4 reconstitution um, early post transplant by day 100 had an improved non relapse mortality of only 5% compared to 35% in those who um, did not achieve early CD4 immune reconstitution. And this same signal was seen in the subset of patients who underwent transplant for malignant disease. So they were able to identify no difference in the incidence of relapse across these three exposures to ATG, but preserve uh, non-relapse mortality in those who had the lowest exposure to ATG. And when they looked at cause of death across the ex three exposure groups, as you can see, the most significant change difference was in death from infection in the overexposed, in the highest exposed group. And this again, the, the idea that infectious death was largely driving um, the difference in non-relapse mortality links back to this earlier study done by the Dutch looking at outcomes of adenovirus in this example in patients with early CD4 reconstitution. And, you know, I, I, I can't give a talk like this without talking about adoptive T cell therapies. And so we have looked at um, now a cohort of 59 patients treated with third party CMV specific T cells and looked for predictors of response. And when we think about the things that typically are associated with high risk of mortality from CMV, they were not significantly different in responding and non-responding patients in this cohort of people who were receiving third-party CMV CTLs. And really, that's, that's not because it didn't make a difference, but more because these, the group is already skewed to a at-risk patient population. And, but what did make a difference was a baseline CD4 count greater than 50. So this would, was the baseline CD4 at the time of infusion. And this was significantly predictive of response to adoptively transferred CMB specific T cells. And we had previously demonstrated this in a larger cohort of patients receiving both donor derived CMV specific T cells, but it's also true in the setting of third party CMV specific T cells. And so we have, how do we move to thinking about this both as an endpoint, but also how can we improve CD4 reconstitution? And, and so we also looked at other, um, other endpoints that may or may not be modulated by early CD4 reconstitution. And in a joint analysis with the Dutch, uh, the MSK data and the Dutch data demonstrated that while there's no difference in the incidence of acute GVHD in pediatric recipients of transplant, in those who do or did not achieve early CD4 immune reconstitution, Alternatively, in the large cohort of those undergoing T-depleted transplantation at MSK, there's a trend towards a higher incidence of graft-versus-host disease in those most overexposed. But in the pediatric cohort, what we showed was that death from GVHD or non-relapse mortality in those with GVHD was significantly higher in those patients who did not have CD4, early CD4 reconstitution. And in the Dutch subset, they were able to look at the CD4 reconstitution specifically right at the time of onset of GVHD. And when you looked at onset of grade three to four graft versus host disease, 
you can see is significantly inferior non-relapse mortality and overall survival in those patients who did not have CD4 immune reconstitution at the time of developing graft versus host disease. And so early CD4 immune reconstitution really is associated with improved overall survival across platforms, including in recipients of T-cell depleted transplant and associated with improved survival in patients with either viral infections or graft versus host disease. So how can we optimize early CD4 immune reconstitution and move beyond ATG? Um, because ATG is um, conditioning regimen specific. And so in this publication by Rob Seufer, he saw that, um, and this is without um, population PK or targeted dosing of the ATG. He saw that the different regimens had different survival based on the addition or not of ATG and linked this to the absolute lymphocyte count at the, on the day of infusion of ATG. But as you've heard from Dr. Kubel, fludarabine exposure also um, makes a difference in terms of both event-free survival, non-relapse mortality, and immune reconstitution. And so prospective clinical trials have now been done looking at weight and ALC-based versus weight-based dosing of ATG. And this is um, data from the prospective trial run in the Netherlands and is submitted for publication with an increased cumulative incidence of early CD4 immune reconstitution in those receiving weight and ALC-based dosing of ATG compared to um, the historical control. And they were also able to demonstrate a difference in overall survival, both in those who had um, successful immune reconstitution in the historical control, as well as those with successful immune reconstitution in the intervention group. And this was um, similarly um, different in therapy-related or, or treatment-related mortality with a hazard ratio of five. And as you've already heard, there's a prospective trial looking at individualized fludarabine dosing. And so really, the milestone of early CD4 immune reconstitution is a predictor of outcome after transplant across platforms. And the results of these prospective trials are really demonstrating that it's modifiable and that we can increase the proportion of hematopoietic transplant recipients who achieve this milestone by individually targeting the dosing on well-designed trials. And it's also an early and important outcome of currently accruing trials, um, both in terms of the targeted dosing as well as for the T-depleted platforms. And we really need to strive to create the most favorable immune milieu after hematopoietic and cell therapies. And um, I, would, I would echo Alicia's and other speakers' words that this is really a very nice platform for post-hematopoietic transplant therapies. And I think the advantages of using a T-cell depleted transplant platform for adoptive therapies is that you are performing those therapies in the absence of an exogenous immune suppression and have the potential for homeostatic expansion of all of these different populations. So um, currently in trial are donor-derived T-cell progenitors, uh, donor-derived or third-party derived antigen-specific T-cells, as well as gene-modified T-cells. There's a potential for CAR T-cells in this setting and K-cells and cytokine-induced um, killer cells, all with the goal of improving control of infection and disease while maintaining a low risk of graft-versus-host disease. 
I, I will go back to the setting of adoptive T cell therapy for viral infections to talk about one of the potential disadvantages in the setting, specifically in the setting of mismatch transplants. So, so we know um, in the setting of mismatch transplants, when we've generated viral specific T cells from haploidentical donors, it is not uncommon that the donor derived viral specific T cell population is restricted in its recognition of a virus through an HLA allele that's not shared by the patient. So this is just an example of a patient who underwent haploidentical transplantation for SCID, and we had generated CMP-specific T cells from the patient's mother, but they were restricted by the non-shared allele. And so for this patient, third-party T cells with demonstrated restriction through a shared allele were the option of choice. And what I mean by the latter is that we at MSK have consistently used cytotoxicity against a panel of targets, each sharing only one HLA allele with the donor T cell line to evaluate and isolate where the HLA restriction is. So in this example, cytotoxicity against EBV positive targets sharing the B0801 and C0701 alleles demonstrates that this donor T cell line recognizes EBV positive targets in an HLA restricted specific way and prevents off target killing, but also enables us to use them in a mismatched way. And so I, I would echo the idea that we need to capitalize on this ideal platform for adoptive cell therapy. And there's really a broad armamentarium of adoptive cell therapies that are available, including autologous primary donor and third party derived populations with multiple targets. We've demonstrated previously that the responses can be durable, um, but that we need to integrate um, known HLA disparities into our algorithms for these therapies and expand to other targets. Just need to acknowledge uh, Yap Yam Bolens, the, who really led the incentives for these trials and has led us in identifying early CD4 immune reconstitution as such an important marker of outcome and predictor of outcomes and a modifiable predictor of outcomes. Um, for the ATG study, Madhvi Lakaraja and Mike Scordo, the CD4 immune reconstitution team, I think I named along the way, the viral specific T cell program led by Richard O'Reilly and our statistical team, study teams, research nurses, and the pediatric and medicine clinical care teams and our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Susan. This was a great intro of this session. So let's go ahead with Andy uh, Gennery, who will be the next speaker. Andy, welcome. Uh, Andy is a, a professor in pediatric immunology and BMT in Newcastle, and he will speak and present today the alpha beta CD19 B cell depleted haplotransplant in PID, the UK experience. Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Yap and uh, Alicia and the organisers for asking me to talk. Um, I am going to, um, a bit like Susan, not entirely stick to the title. Um, I am going to talk about alpha beta T cell depletion, uh, but I'm going to give you a little bit of background. And whilst I am going to give you the UK experience, the majority of that experience actually is in Newcastle. So the majority of the data that I'm going to share with you today our Newcastle data, although there are some UK data uh, within that. Uh, and it's just a shame that we can't be um, together in Stanford. Uh, that would be great, but uh, maybe another time. So I have no relevant disclosures. Um, I love this slide um, because I think it shows the importance of paediatrics in the story of stem cell transplant, not only of paediatrics, but actually of primary immunodeficiency. I think that you could argue that the story of therapeutic transplant as a regular intervention really starts here in 1968 um, in the States and also in Leiden in the Netherlands when there were three patients transplanted uh, for primary immunodeficiency, two skin babies 
uh, and a patient with Wiskel Aldrich syndrome. So I think as paediatricians and certainly as PID doctors, you know, we can be proud that we were really here at the start of the story. We've had a number of milestones along the journey um, and even I would argue introduced the first um, uh, licensed um, gene therapy uh, vector uh, Strymvalis for treating ADA uh, gene, uh, sorry, ADA deficient skid. Um, and of course, um, you may not recognize this young man who had Wiscott Aldrich syndrome. This of course is Anthony Nolan. Um, and this young boy didn't have a matched brother or sister uh, and therefore was unable to have a transplant and unfortunately died of his disease. And in his honor, his mother set up the Anthony Nolan Register, which was the first unrelated donor registry in the world. And there's now what, over 40, probably 45 million um, unrelated donors registered on, on registries throughout the world. So again, rather tragic in some ways, but good came from that. But what we want to talk about today, of course, is those patients where there's neither a matched unrelated nor a matched related donor. And so we're having to consider T cell depletion. Now, in Europe, we've been um, collecting data from the uh, primary immunodeficiency transplants in the central database in Paris, the Sketed database. And periodically, we publish those data. Uh, they include, of course, the first patient who was ever transplanted in 1968. Uh, and here at the top of the slide, you can see the first publication from that series. And we can see these are HLA mismatched T cell depleted transplants with about a 60% survival. Now things probably have got better, although I'm not sure we can see them in this next uh, publication uh, in um, uh, uh, 1990. Uh, here on the right of the slide, we have the uh, HLA non-identical T cell depleted transplants. I'd like to say things have improved with time, but I think it would be difficult really to argue that. I'm happy to say that more recently, things definitely have improved. Um, in Newcastle, um, we have been transplanting since 1987 and T cell depleted transplants really began our story. Our first patient had a T cell depleted transplant, unfortunately, it was a child with skid who died. Um, but our second transplant, um, actually a, a whole year later, uh, again, a child with skid uh, and again, a T cell depleted transplant. So T cell depleted transplants have been part of our story from the very beginning, right up to now. Uh, and we are still heavily involved in that field. Now, initially our transplants were using Campath1M. I know we should be calling it Alumtuzumab, except Campath1M actually isn't Alumtuzumab. Uh, and it really was uh, a monoclonal antibody, well, probably not even entirely monoclonal actually, uh, made in the back of someone's shed, I think, uh, or certainly lab in Cambridge. Um, and we published our data from uh, the initial transplants that we did, actually spanning a, a, um, a, a 10 year period. And we had uh, 30 transplants for SCID with 63% survival. We switched at the end of 1998 <coughs> to CD34 selection for a number of reasons, one of which at least was that Campath was not going to be available, uh, but also the Milteni uh, platform was beginning to come on stream. And so we moved to the CD34 selection platform. Um, again, we published this 10 years later, we'd done 22 patients and we had a better survival. Um, but when we look back, we were quite concerned that the chimerism that we were getting um, wasn't as good with the uh, CD34 platform as it had been with the Campath 1M. Uh, and a very wise colleague of mine, Mario Abenin, one of my mentors, was always telling me about the soup uh, and that what we're giving patients is like the soup. And actually it's not just the mushrooms that are important, um, but it's all of the other ingredients in it as well. And so whilst of course the CD34 T cell, uh, sorry, CD34 cells are key, actually, a number of these other elements, uh, including stromal cells, probably are important to help improve uh, donor chimerism. And so we switched as the, the newer platform became available to the CD3, CD19 depleted transplants. Um, they did seem to engraft more quickly and we certainly saw um, better viral control. Uh, but even so, we were still anxious about patients who had significant viral loads coming into transplant. And therefore, um, we weren't using as many of these procedures as maybe we had been in the CAMPATH days. 
Um, and this slide, uh, courtesy of Sue Han, really just shows the evolution of our haploidentical transplants in Newcastle. So 1987, uh, using marrow, we were using Campath 1M. Uh, we then moved to the CD34 selection. Uh, we did some uh, CD3, CD19 depletions. You can see here just seven, in fact. Um, but in uh, about 2012, um, we moved, well, 2008, in fact, we really moved to the TCR alpha beta, uh, but actually we were also using the PBSCs. And I think that has um, made quite a significant difference to what we do as well. I think we need to remember that when we're changing platforms, there are many other things that are changing as well. And probably the other big significant change for us uh, during this time was that in 2007, we also introduced fludarabine and triosulfan um, uh, conditioning uh, rather than uh, busulfan and cyclophosphamide. And I'm sure that uh, amongst many of the things that we've done, this has also had a significant impact. This is the conditioning regimen that we use for our TCR alpha beta transplants. Being good Europeans, uh, we uh, do follow the European protocol with a stem of uh, fludarabine and, and triosulfan. Um, Thiotipa sometimes, I think we've not, not entirely worked out when we should be using it usually not for skid patients, increasingly using it for patients with primary immunodeficiency uh, that's not skid, especially when we're looking for good donor chimerism. Although the data that we've looked at has actually shown no difference in chimerism, whether we give thiotipa or not. So I think that's a story uh, that will continue to evolve. So these are the joint UK data that we published back in 2018. Um, this was data gathered from Great Ormond Street and from Newcastle. Uh, we had 25 patients who had 26 transplants. Um, and I think uh, whilst the survival was very good in those who didn't have viral infection on the day of transplant, it was significantly uh, poorer for those who had persistent viral infection. I think an interesting observation, which I'll talk about in the next couple of slides actually, is looking at the mix of patients that we're transplanting. And you can see that the skid, but there's a whole variety of other diagnoses uh, now being transplanted. So in this UK cohort, we saw um, naive CD4 and CD8 T cells. Maybe um, uh, we could see them at around three months, but certainly by four months of uh, post-transplant, we were beginning to see these cells coming through. And that kind of coincided with a drop in the TCR alpha beta uh, percentage and a rise in the uh, TCR alpha beta percentage, perhaps not surprisingly. Um, so Mary and I, um, uh, uh, three or four years ago now, uh, were asked to write um, a review article on uh, T-cell depletion methods and we focused on the TCR alpha beta depletion and at that stage we were really looking in the, the detailed PID transplant information both from our own paper but also from the paper published in Moscow, which was um, really the three groups that I think pioneered this for, for primary immunodeficiency were Moscow, uh, Rome and um, Newcastle, but also a little bit Great Ormond Street. Um, and again, you can see that combining the Moscow published data and the, um, the UK published data, we have an overall survival of 90%. And I think that looks much better than when you look at those graphs from the sketted data uh, that was published, that, that I showed you earlier on, that was published uh, back in the 1990s. Um, and interestingly, uh, actually the majority of patients were transplanted for non-skid primary immunodeficiencies. And again, you have a breakdown here. Um, and um, what was really interesting is when we compared uh, the uh, sketted data that was published, um, in fact it's the, the latest publication published in 2010, although the, the next iteration of this um, I think has just about been accepted for publication, but when you look at that uh, published in 2010, the majority of T-cell depleted transplants were undertaken for patients with SCID, um, and non-SCID made up about a quarter of those transplants, and I think what's really game-changing with this TCR alpha beta platform is it has completely revolutionized uh, who we are now transplanting. And you can see here, and again, this is from the, the, the review paper that Mary and I did with the Moscow and the UK data, uh, rather than a quarter non-skid, it's now a quarter skid uh, and the rest are non-skid. And so there's been a complete uh, change, I think, in the landscape of offering um, T cell depleted transplants to patients that really previously we would have been anxious to offer those to. 
So um, we published um, earlier this year um, our uh, alpha beta depleted transplant results and compared it with the other methods that we had been uh, using. Um, and you can see um, here that, um, as I said, there's been a change really in practice so that for the three early platforms, SCID was the predominant diagnosis that we were transplanting for, uh, but actually that has completely reversed. Uh, and the majority of patients that we now transplant have other non-SCID primary immunodeficiencies. Um, and that's also reflected, of course, in the age of transplant because SCIDs are transplanted generally before the age of the year. Um, and given that we're now transplanting more non-SCID patients, then the, um, uh, the median age at time of transplant has, of course, risen. Um, we haven't really changed our conditioning or we've changed the conditioning agents, but most of our patients do get conditioned. Um, we have changed the serotherapy practice, and that's because ATG and alemtuzumab are in the European protocol, uh, which we have adopted for our TCR alpha beta CD19 uh, transplants. Um, the GVHD prophylaxis has been a little bit hit and miss. We weren't giving really any for Campas. We did tend to give some for the CD34 selected marrow because we were seeing some GVHD. And remember in primary immunodeficiency, there's no benefit to getting GVHD. So we do try and avoid it. Um, and it's been about half and half for the TCR alpha betas. Uh, and I'll explain a little bit about that in a minute. So when we look at the graph composition, we see that in the new method, we have a much, much higher CD34, T, uh, CD34 cell dose. And the reason for that is actually because we've gone from using marrow donors to using PBSC donors. And so of course, within that, you get a much higher uh, stem cell dose. Uh, and of course, because we are not completely doing a, an absolute T cell depletion, uh, but preserving some T cells, then we do actually have a higher CD3 uh, cell dose in our um, graft uh, composition uh, today. Now, what was important when we looked at the survival for these different methods was that the TCR alpha beta method uh, actually came out best. Um, and again, I think we need to be careful when we compare these results because we're looking at a 30 year history and the platform of depletion is not the only thing that has changed over time. But as I indicated, our um, chemotherapy protocols have changed, but also many other aspects of care, including, for instance, viral surveillance, which we weren't able to do at the beginning and are now doing routinely. Um, we have uh, better diagnostic methods for uh, fungal, viral and um, uh, bacterial infection, which again, we didn't have at the beginning, and a whole host of things that have gone on to help improve transplant outcomes. Uh, but I have no doubt that the platform is at least um, partially uh, um, involved in that improvement. So we have an overall survival using uh, the TCR alpha beta method uh, for all patients coming in of about 77%, which is, a, I think, compares very favorably uh, with the sketted data. Interestingly, when we look at patients with severe combined immunodeficiency, uh, and there's a typo here, this should actually not be 0%, uh, but indeed 100% for our alpha beta depleted transplants with five year overall survival of 100%, uh, both with the CD3, CD19 platform and with the alpha beta CD19 platform as well. And that compares very favorably and statistically significantly different from our older methods of T cell depletion. However, when we look at non-SCID, uh, there's really a very different story. Um, and the overall survival drops from 100% for SCIDs down to 70%. Uh, now that is mixed depending on which of the um, primary immunodeficiencies that we're looking at. And, and of course there is a numbers issue here because there's a relatively small number um, of uh, patients transplanted, 26 in total. And when we do the subgroup analysis, it really is very small. CGD, I think we've done about seven now. Um, and we have 100% survival still, um, but some of the other diseases, uh, we're still losing patients occasionally. Um, and what was really important actually was not only that um, the uh, survival for the non-skid primary immunodeficiencies was not as good, but when we split it by age, then actually those who were younger were doing much better than those transplanted uh, beyond the age of five years. And again, a, a significant difference. And this um, uh, five year gap has been seen with other um, 
primary immunodeficiencies, not, not, not to do with platforms, but to do with the primary immunodeficiency WISCOT, for instance, uh, we've seen that um, gap. And the most recent SCETID data, again, which is uh, just about to be submitted for publication, shows this, which I think was first um, described by Lisa Filipovic in Wiskel Aldrich syndrome. And I'm not sure there's a magic uh, about the number five, but it just indicates that the older you are, the more damage. And actually, more importantly here, the more infection that you've got, uh, the more risk there is. When we looked at acute GVHD, uh, there wasn't really any significant differences. We've only had one um, uh, poor uh, GVHD outcome in the TCR alpha beta uh, depletion patients, and that was actually a patient, it was a combined immune deficiency patient who we got at the age of about 18 months who had disseminated multi drug resistant CMV. And we were very worried about CMV. Uh, we were trying to give uh, maternal CMV selected T cells because we did a maternal graft. Uh, and we were worried about the effects of serotherapy on those cells and that the child would die of CMV. Um, and so, in fact, we omitted the serotherapy from the conditioning protocol. Um, he didn't get um, any uh, worsening of his CMV, and we did get the CMV under control, but he got grade four GVHD, which we were unable to control. So we won't do that again in a hurry. We do give a serotherapy for all of our patients. Um, this shows that the uh, myeloid chimerism is very good in patients uh, getting TCR alpha beta depleted transplants. And so uh, the summary from this uh, manuscript was that outcomes after the haplo uh, transplants using TCR alpha beta depletion uh, were very good and that it's a very safe alternative donor procedure in SCID and non-SCID primary immunodeficiency. Um, for SCID, I think it can argue the, you can argue that it changes the donor hierarchy and that we would ideally use a sibling, um, but if we haven't got a sibling, um, pretty much we now go straight to a haplo identical donor. Uh, and would certainly prefer that over a matched unrelated donor. If we've got a cord blood, we might think about it, um, but I think increasingly we're switching to the haploidentical donor uh, as choice. And I have to say, in some instances, I actually prefer that even to a sibling uh, because we get such a good stem cell dose and we get very good engraftment. For the non-skids, um, I think it's a bit more tricky. Age is certainly an important predictor of outcome and the transplant ideally should be performed as early as possible. But as, of course, as transplanters, we don't always have the option of when patients are going to come to us. We have to take them when they're referred, and we may wish to have had them some years before, uh, but that we don't have any control over that. Um, I just want to bring this up. We've done three patients who had uh, steroid-resistant skin GVHD that we were unable to control with any means, uh, including ECP. And for three of these patients now, we've actually wiped the slate clean and conditioned them and done a TCR alpha beta depleted transplant from a parent. Um, this was the first one that we did that we reported uh, and we've done two others successfully. I have to say they've all been fairly hairy transplants um, and certainly one of the patients also got veno occlusive disease uh, and spent some time on intensive care. But all patients have done well uh, with good donor chimerism um, and are at home. I think they're all off medication now and have got good immune reconstitution. And I'm pretty confident that for all three of those patients, if we hadn't done that procedure, uh, they would have been unlikely to be alive today. And that brings me on to this manuscript. Um, this is um, a, um, an editorial that I wrote um, in response to this important paper from the Moscow group led uh, in this instance by Alexandra Laburko. Uh, and what she was able to show was that in the big series of TCR alpha beta depleted transplants that Moscow have done, that the outcomes for match, uh, mismatched related donors were as good for matched unrelated donors. And their message really was that actually don't bother looking for, uh, for MUDs or mismatched MUDs, but just get on and use the, um, the mismatched related donor. And that's certainly true, but we've kind of turned that on its head because, of course, there are very, very occasionally times when you are unable to use um, a, a parental donor for whatever reason. Uh, and we've now actually used seven mismatched unrelated donors when we've not been able to use a parent, uh, rather than using a whole marrow or whole PBSC 
um, mismatched product, we will do a T cell depletion and they've been very successful. And this is just a summary um, of our numbers for TCR alpha beta depletion up to April of this year. We've done 71 procedures. And again, you can see that there's a complete mix of diseases, actually not very many SCID patients. Um, a lot of combined immune deficiency, some patients with immune dysregulation defects, including HLH, phagocytic defects, including uh, leukocyte adhesion deficiency and CGD. Uh, we've done some intrinsic or innate defects. These are all the IUIS um, classification. Uh, we've done one patient with C1Q deficiency uh, and two auto-inflammatory defects, one with A20 uh, and one with hyper-IgD. And as I say, we've actually done uh, three patients who actually had underlying SCID, um, but needed a, a second transplant to cure their acute graft versus host disease. So um, when we've looked at our overall survival for non-SCID primary immunodeficiency, um, I think that you could argue that the T depleted results compare very favorably indeed with the T replete results. Um, but again, when we actually break that down to age, we find that there's a significant difference for the T cell depleted in those less than five where survival is the same uh, versus those more than five where the survival is significantly worse. Um, and the reason for that is not GVHD, but it's viremia. Uh, and um, we showed before in the UK paper that patients with active viral infection uh, present at the time of transplant had a much worse outcome than those who've got um, viral infection controlled. Um, and you can see here that the cumulative incidence of viremia um, is higher in the T-cell depleted transplants rather than in the T-replete ones. And I guess for the reasons that Susan uh, has just alluded to. And so that's led us on to the next exciting development. Uh, we have just got a grant from the MRC. Uh, Sue Han Lum is going to be leading on that. And we're going to be doing CD3, TCR alpha beta, CD19 depleted transplants with a CD45 RA depleted or CD45RO memory T cell add back. Um, over um, three years, we're going to recruit 40 patients uh, with non skid primary immunodeficiency. Um, we'll be using uh, partially matched family donors. Um, uh, initially, for the first 12 patients, we're going to trial the dose of 0 0.3, 0 0.6, or 1 times 10 to the 6 per kilo um, CD45 RO memory T cells to add back. Uh, we're also doing a prospective um, ATG pharmacokinetic study uh, with our in Lancaster in uh, Leiden um, as part of that. And then hopefully when we have worked out the appropriate dose of ATG or timing of giving uh, the appropriate dose of uh, memory T cells, then we've got another 25 patients to recruit to that study. Uh, and so I hope that in um, a few years time, we'll be able to update this talk showing that the outcome for TCR alpha beta transplants with ADBAC is as good for patients, older patients with viral infection as we've seen for younger non-SCID PID patients and also for the skid patients as well. And certainly for those two groups of patients, I would explain to parents today that survival outcomes are as good, whichever donor you use, and really what um, determines the outcome of a transplant is the physical condition of the patient rather than the donor that we're able to use. And so I'd like to think that were Anthony Nolan being referred today, we would actually have an option for him uh, and we'd be able to cure him of his disease. On the other hand, if that story hadn't happened, then maybe we wouldn't have all of the unrelated donors that we're able to choose in many instances for our patients. So um, I'm going to leave it at that, uh, particularly acknowledge Sue Han and Mary Slatter. Uh, Sue Han, who's been very involved in collecting a lot of the data that I've presented today. Mary, who with me has kind of set up our T cell depletion program. Um, colleagues uh, who have uh, been mentors and since retired, and also colleagues still on the ward. And then Anne Dickinson, who was in our stem cell lab right from the beginning in 1987 until just a couple of years ago, uh, and Kay Carruthers in the stem cell lab who's taken over from her. Um, and at that, I'm going to stop and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for this nice overview. Um, so we will take the various questions after the next talk. And please, audience, don't hesitate to and to uh, post the various questions in the Q and A 
box. Um, I'm happy and uh, to introduce to you Michael Marchand from um, Moscow. He is going to talk about viral infections after alpha beta T cell depletion. Michael, floor is yours. Thank you, Yapyang, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Alicia, for uh, inviting it. The, the, it is real, real great opportunity to talk, and the title of the talk is "Memory DLI Approach to Control uh, Viral Infections After Alpha Beta T Cell Depleted Hematopoietic Stem Cell Transplantation." And I will touch upon many topics which were already discussed by Susan and uh, 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 Andy. And uh, first of all, introducing not the technology because the technology of alpha beta depletion is uh, no introduction to this audience, but our program uh, uh, of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation in Dmitry Rogachev Center in Moscow was started almost 10 years ago. And uh, we believe that uh, actually we adopted the, the alpha beta T cell depletion as a platform, uh, both for haploidentical identical and matched uh, unrelated transplantation, because we hope to solve the key problems of transplantation, namely engraftment and GVHD. And in case of success and equal outcomes for Hopland, much unrelated transplantation, this would create a breakthrough in providing access to, to therapy uh, in a country with limited donor register, which is unfortunately still the case uh, in Russia. So we've published on that. And uh, after uh, several years, we, we realized that across uh, I would not say all, but most of the indications uh, we used uh, of beta T cell depletion uh, we had more or less the same uh, 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 situation with equal, uh, if not better, outcomes for haplo uh, compared to much unrelated in acute leukemia, primary immune deficiency, and, uh, other indications. But what uh, uh, really bothered us was the uh, 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 fact that we could not push the bar of non-relapse mortality below 10%. And the key reason here, since, since engraftment and uh, GVHD were, were actually under uh, good control uh, in most patients, the, the key problem uh, which, which ca came up were viral infections, which, was, which actually was already uh, discussed by previous speakers. And this was, uh, uh, CMV, uh, the CMV reactivation rate was over 50%, especially in the setting of uh, uh, donor, uh, CMV negative donors to CMV positive recipient transplantation. And of course, adenovirus with uh, fulminant uh, fatal infections, which were really difficult to control with preemptive therapy. Uh, and But also a bunch of other viruses. We, we had outbreaks of norovirus, RS virus, we had deaths due to different viruses. So this, this became kind of most important problem to be uh, solved. And uh, when we, uh, during these early years, uh, as Susan had uh, referenced, to, we actually were looking at uh, immune reconstitution uh, uh, characteristics, and we realized that during these early early months after alpha beta depleted transplant, the immune reconstitution, although quantitatively we have sometimes enough T cells, we realized that the diversity of TCR repertoire uh, is uh, rather low, and that uh, diverse repertoire actually uh, uh, is generated after naive T cells with. Uh, thymus function recover after four to six months after transplantation. And of course, we're all uh, protected with this diverse T cell, uh, TCR repertoire. And it became clear that this, this early months after alpha beta depleted transplant, uh, actually, we have to find some approach to, uh, to improve this pathogen uh, specific immunity. And we came across the technology of CD45 array depletion, which, uh, of course, there, there was a lot of preclinical work uh, suggesting that L reactivity is concentrated in the naive T cell uh, compartment and that depleting 45 array positive cells uh, lowers the frequency of L reactive uh, T cells by uh, a factor of 10, one log, and that these cells retain broad pathogen reactivity. And also, we knew that the platform, the, 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 the large-scale depletion of 
45 array positive cells was already developed by Seattle and St. Jude in the output setting, which was really successful, but still had some uh, incidence of non severe uh, GVHD. And uh, we thought that maybe uh, staying with the uh, alphabetic depletion, we could add a low dose memory T cell prophylaxis based on the fact that the frequency of event uh, of interest is high the cost of therapy is high, and there is also a risk of pathology due to tissue damage with late cell therapy. And uh, choosing memory T cells as effectors was interesting because of the multi-pathogen reactivity, and uh, they might represent the repertoire of T cells reactive towards common pathogens within family in the HAPO setting. And of course, uh, it seemed to be very practical because we had a, a relatively easy way uh, to manufacture the cell straightforward uh, selection, both manual and later on, uh, based on automatic uh, prodigy bioreactor. And the uh, case for low dose use was that uh, we reasoned that physiologic immune response uh, starts from few antigen specific T cells. And uh, we also realized that the risk of GVHD uh, with, with the 45 array depletion is not zero if you infuse millions of millions of memory T cells due to cross reactivity probably. So we uh, initiated a pilot trial in 2014 to evaluate the uh, safety and biological correlates of this uh, memory T cell infusions. Uh, the idea was simple. Uh, after engraftment of alphabet T cell depleted crops at day 30 plus, we infused uh, uh, at monthly intervals, uh, uh, 45 array depleted T cells and escalating those from 25 to 100,000 uh, per kilo in the HAPLO setting and from 100 to 300,000 uh, per kilo in the unrelated donor setting, evaluating uh, the uh, safety based on GVHD uh, and uh, also uh, biological correlates based on. Uh, recovery of virus specific, uh, uh, virus specific T cells measured by Elispot uh, in peripheral blood. Uh, it was re rewarding to see that uh, among patients with uh, absent uh, uh, reactivity towards specific virus, in this case C and B, uh, in a significant proportion, close to 50% of the patients we saw uh, a nice increment of uh, virus specific uh, T cells within uh, several weeks after uh, infusion, and in most patients, in most patients, uh, these virus specific T cells persistent uh, till at least one year uh, after infusion. Regarding the safety, uh, uh, as I suggested, the uh, in the extended cohort of 130 patients with 60% malignant and 60% haplo uh, donors. Uh, uh, the incidence of de novo acute GVHD was 7% with very few uh, cases of uh, uh, grade three, no grade fours and uh, uh, mostly limited chronic GVHD, which confirmed the general safety, uh, 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 the general safety of the approach. And uh, 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 later on, we were able, actually the question, uh, one of the biological questions was whether we really do any anything uh, uh, with these low doses of uh, uh, memory T cells and uh, uh, by sequencing and tracking the uh, uh, T cell receptors, uh, TCR repertoire, we were able to demonstrate uh, that actually these memory DLIs do contribute to TCR diversity early on at three to four months post infusion and even uh, later at one year uh, post-infusion by, by demonstrating that there is an, a clear overlap uh, of this uh, repertoire between infusion uh, and uh, the patient compared uh, to the uh, patients with, without uh, DLI. So the key results, uh, uh, the key lessons of this pilot experience was, uh, was that if, if we use low dose memory DLI early post engraftment that these infusions are safe, reasonably safe. They may help to recover immunity to CMV, sometimes to uh, other uh, viruses. They do persist and contribute to TCR repertoire post-transplant. 
but they're obviously too late to prevent uh, CMV viremia because the median time to CMV PCR positivity was around 30 days. So infusing at day 30 plus was by, by no means could, could prevent uh, uh, CMV viremia. Our, uh, uh, in order to further develop this uh, approach, uh, uh, we thought that we have to really uh, put this on trial and to directly uh, test uh, the, the safety and efficacy for CMD reactivation. And the hypothesis here was that low dose memory DLI will be able to prevent CMD reactivation. But to do this, they should be infused with co infused with the graft at day zero. And these infusions will not increase uh, the risk of GVHD. Actually, infusing at day zero in the uh, post conditioning inflammatory milieu could, could be different to post engraftment infusion. So, this was still uh, a question. Uh, and to do this, we had to tackle the uh, ATG problem, which uh, was already discussed here. Uh, we see a very high variability uh, of ATG, active ATG. Uh, 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 concentration at day zero. This was provided by Dmitry Balashov, uh, work done in collaboration with Aaron Lancaster in, in Leiden. Uh, and uh, uh, so we took a slightly different approach from playing with the dose and timing uh, of thymoglobulin. Uh, uh, and we looked at the possibility of completely uh, emitting ATG and replacing it with a combination of uh, drugs, uh, we picked up two, two medications, a beta -seft and tocilizumab, which are well known in pediatric rheumatology. And uh, the key features uh, for, for this choice, choice was that the, the two drugs are non not, not overtly lymphodepleting. They potentially would less interfere with memory T cell responses, MK and gamma delta T cell function. And they did have some record, at, at, at least uh, at that moment, uh, uh, in, in the abstract form for GVHD prophylaxis or uh, therapy. So uh, 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 this is how the basic regimen looked like, uh, the trilsulfan or TBI as basic myeloblative agent, thiotipa as a second uh, myelotoxic agent, fludarabin, uh, and um, uh, rituximab and bortezomib, which is a, a slightly different story. And ATG was completely replaced with one shot of docilizumab and four injections of a beta uh, at uh, weekly and then biweekly intervals till, till day 28. Uh, the design was really simple. Uh, uh, the population was patients with hematologic malignancies, children with hematologic malignancies. Uh, they were randomized to uh, uh, receive uh, memory DLI starting from day zero at 25,000 per kilo, then monthly at 50,000 per kilo uh, uh, versus standard supportive care and evaluated for uh, primary endpoints uh, of QGVHD and cumulative incidence of CMV and secondary endpoints of uh, major clinical uh, outcomes. And of course, all received the alphabet depleted graft. These are the cohort uh, characteristics. This is just to show that uh, you, you can see that there were 76 to 73 patients randomized to uh, experimental and control groups. Or they, they were uh, more or less balanced, uh, except for slight, slightly different, oops, slightly different number of uh, uh, ALL and AML, and uh, due to this uh, different use of TBI and triosulfan, uh, uh, with more TBI in the uh, control arm. And the graft characteristics were uh, very, very close to what uh, Andy and uh, Alicia were talking about, suggesting that the general platform used at different centers is very, really very, very robust. And there were uh, over 90% of uh, haploidentical donors in, in this cohort. Uh, there were no problems with engraftment. So I skipped, I skipped engraftment because it was 99 with the same median days to platelets and, and 
neutrophils, as Alicia suggested, but you can see that there was no difference in acute GVHD incidence and uh, 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 chronic GVHD incidence, and the incidence of grade three, four was around uh, five, six uh, percent uh, 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 in this population. Uh, so in terms of safety, we were fine, but in terms of primary efficacy and point of prevention of CMB reactivation, we were uh, not good enough. So we were not able to demonstrate the predicted effect, although there was slight, uh, slightly less CMB reactivations in the uh, DLI, uh, MDLI uh, plus arm, uh, still it was not enough to, to be statistically significant. So in this, in this uh, uh, relation, this was a, a negative study. Uh, regarding the other viruses, we, we saw rather low reactivation rates, although they were monitored uh, weekly, at least till day, uh, till, till four months, till, till day 120 post, post transplant. And uh, 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 so what, 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 did, did, did these cells really do anything good? Uh, I, I would say yes, because it seems that the uh, rate of uh, the frequency of virus specific T cells or the proportion of patients uh, with a recovery of CMV specific T cells by day 30 after transplantation was uh, somewhat higher in the whole group. And it was statistically significant uh, difference, 50% more patients recovered uh, CMV-specific T cells among the cohort of uh, seropositive recipients, confirming the general uh, uh, observation that you really need uh, exposure to the antigen in order to successfully expand um, uh, virus-specific T cells in vivo. Uh, and here are the key clinical outcomes. And uh, you can see that the non-relapse mortality was really striking. This, this is a cohort of 150 uh, acute leukemias transplanted from haplodonors with intensive uh, myeloablative conditioning. And still you have a 2% non-relapse mortality, which was really very, very unexpected. All of these are first transplants. There were no second transplants in this cohort, but still uh, very impressive. No difference in terms of relapse incidence and no difference in, in terms of event free and overall survival. So, the key lessons of this uh, trial, which was published early this year, was that uh, first of all, uh, interestingly, replacement of ITG does, uh, with, with this targeted immune suppression does not compromise engraftment of GVHD control with the caveat that this could be specific to a particular pharmacologic context, including uh, bartezomib, for example. So uh, I'm not sure that if this can be really replicated in, in, in other circumstances, but, but still, I think that this is interesting and uh, that uh, low dose memory DLI do not cause excess GVHD. They are not able to prevent CMV viremia, at least to a predicted extent. They may improve recovery of virus specific T cells early post transplant. They don't seem to affect the incidence of uh, leukemia relapse. And that non relapse mortality was low, irrespective actually of memory DLI. So uh, here we come back to the question of uh, ATG and how the uh, ATG affects non relapse mortality and immune reconstitution. So, uh, when we saw this uh, nice results with the non-relapse mortality, we, we wanted to came back and to compare the outcome of uh, uh, alpha depleted transplantation in leukemia with or without ATG. And this was a retrospective uh, analysis, was, which was also published recently. Uh, we compared the prospective uh, cohort, the 149 patients transplanted without any ATG, and the historical control, uh, 108 patients which were transplanted during the uh, previous two or three years uh, with the use of uh, uh, thymoglobulin, uh, five milligram per kilo a days, minus five and minus, minus four, so proximal to, to transplant. Uh, and 
uh, all the other uh, supportive care and uh, all the other approaches for uh, the condition regimen was uh, very similar. Uh, since this was a retrospective uh, comparison, uh, the groups were of course not so so well balanced, especially in terms of uh, types of leukemia. We have much uh, higher uh, present, uh, representation of acute myeloid leukemia in the historical co control group and uh, much higher use of TBI in the trial cohort due to some uh, uh, technical circumstances and also due to uh, incre increased number of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients. Uh, but uh, uh, generally, the transplant donors were, were uh, and uh, the, the difference was also in the use of haploidentical donors, which was 90% in the trial cohort and 70% in the historical cohort. Uh, GVHD-wise, we did, do not see a difference in the incidence of acute or chronic uh, GVHD. Uh, uh, nor in the instance of severe acute GVHD. Uh, so th this is again confirming that emission of ITG is uh, at least possible uh, with this platform. Not emission, but replacement of, with, with different uh, approach. And uh, non-relapse mortality was significantly different with the 13% in the ATG and 2% in the uh, ATG free uh, uh, regimens. And regarding the relapse, you can see that actually the incidence of relapse was slightly higher, uh, although not significantly, but still potentially higher in the uh, no ATG uh, group, uh, which could be due to many reasons and can be, can be discussed later. Uh, very importantly, and here we measure uh, the immune reconstitution uh, as early as day 30. This is not day 100 as was discussed, but this is right after transplant, day 30. And this is recovery of key populations. And you can see that there is a significant difference uh, uh, in the number of T cells, alpha beta T cells, and gamma delta T cells in favor of serotherapy free regimen. You can see here the median numbers, uh, uh, which, which is, uh, I think, they're very, uh, very clear shows the, the, the potential effect of ATG on immune reconstitution. Uh, and what is even more interesting, we saw a prolonged influence of. ATG in a sub cohort. These are not all patients, but a prolonged uh, uh, effect of uh, emitting ATG on the recovery of naive T cells up to one year post transplant, which uh, uh, provokes some thinking that, that, that ATG or at least high levels of ATG might also damage some early, early T cell uh, precursors. Uh, 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 and prevent from uh, uh, initiating uh, thymic uh, output uh, early enough. So key lessons from this uh, uh, retrospective analysis uh, is that is, is really corresponds to what was uh, discussed uh, by uh, uh, Susan and published by, by Yapian that ATG overshoot may really negatively impact uh, non-relapse mortality. And the potential mechanism uh, behind this is delayed recovery of T cells. We don't know which are more important, alpha, beta, or gamma, or gamma delta, but also by delayed recovery of thymic regeneration of naive T cells. And uh, based on this analysis, we decided to go back to the uh, more general population uh, transplanted over years and check if. Uh, 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 this early day 30 immune, uh, day 30, day 60 immune reconstitution really affects uh, non relapse mortality across uh, uh, different patients. So we picked up uh, here we have uh, 389 patients transplanted uh, uh, from either hypo identical or much unrelated donors. Th these are all malignant indications over uh, um, this 10 years with available immune, uh, immune reconstitution data. And 
uh, the uh, uh, result here is very clear. This is day 30 immune reconstitution and uh, 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 it is represented here on the graph by alphabetic T cells, which really uh, dichotomize the, 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 the uh, below uh, above median alphabetic T cell recovery as a non-relapse mortality of 1.5%, while below median is 10%. But the same is true for uh, gamma delta T cells and uh, T cells in, in general, while NK cells really uh, don't have this effect. And uh, I don't have this uh, these curves here, but the same is true for non-malignant indications actually, but uh, uh, the prominent difference was on, on day 60, not on day 30 by, uh, after, after transplant. And the, the non-malignant indications for transplant with, with ATG and are still being transplanted with ATG. So, uh, 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 what, what are the weak sides of low-dose memory DLI approach as, as we see it now? First of all, uh, technically, when doing this CD45 array depletion, uh, uh, we lose a lot of CD8 cells, which may eventually affect the, the effect. Since, since the dose is calculated based on uh, CD3 cells, uh, we may really have very low uh, frequency of CD8s in, in, in these infusions. And the second is... Uh, 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 that actually th there's a very high variability of the frequency of very specific cells in healthy donors. You can see up to two log difference in the frequency of very specific cells. So infusing a fixed dose of memory T cell, we can end up with a, uh, a, a two log different doses of very specific T cells, which are probably the, 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 the acting guys here. So this should be taken into account while with, with planning uh, future trials. So we have a short case for uh, memory DLI uh, for, for dose escalation, for the dose escalation. And uh, in a non-trial, uh, non uh, uh, in a non-trial cohort, actually, we were able to uh, do a number of uh, uh, alphabetic T cell depletions in uh, much transplantation, both in uh, siblings and, uh, and in uh, at nine out of 10 uh, or 10 out of 10 parents. So, uh, and uh, a, a fraction of these patients actually received one million of uh, memory DLI per kilo. And we compared the immune recovery of those who received one million uh, DLI per kilo with those who received less than that and also in the haplo setting. And the uh, this is under review at the moment. and we see really uh, in this very small sample uh, with the Kavita, a small sample, we see a significant difference in the, uh, for, uh, in the number of uh, uh, alphabetic T cells early post-transplant, suggesting that maybe uh, further increasing uh, uh, the dose of memory T cells uh, could be beneficial uh, for this uh, patients. So summarizing uh, our current uh, experience, the, the key practical points for 45 array negative DLI is that there are safer doses of 100 uh, per kilo in the hotline and 300 per kilo in the mud. Uh, setting safe at uh, 25,000 at day zero in hoplo, they are able to transfer functional and persistent virus specific immunity. Uh, but to be used at day zero, the problem of ATG should be addressed either by uh, playing with the ATG itself or by replacing it. Uh, in vivo expansion depends on antigen exposure at, and these cells as any uh, virus specific cells can cause uh, iris inflammatory damage to infected tissues due, which, which is sometimes hard to differentiate from GVHD. And the more uh, forward looking questions are, and most uh, painful for us at the moment is the question why emission of ATG did not actually result in better leukemia control because we actually hope that uh, uh, freeing uh, NK cells and gamma delta T cells from ATG could, could make it better for leukemia control. Uh, for MDLI dosing, 
we think that further th those escalation is possible and sh should be tried and possibly an individualized dosing based on uh, virus specific T cell frequency could be, could be used. Vaccination approach for providing antigens, better clinical use of ATG, adding anti leukemia therapeutics. And the last but not the least, uh, uh, I guess that in this ocean of cyclophosphamide data, we will sometime ne uh, need multi center validation of the most promising approaches in the field of alphabet T cell depletion. And with this, I would wish to thank the big team of Dmitry Rogoshev Center. Special thanks to Larissa Shelikhova, Maria Dunaikina, Svetlana Glushkova, and Dmitry Balashov, who provided uh, the data for, 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 for this talk. And uh, uh, special thanks to Rupert Hundrettinger, who shared the vision and uh, generously infected us with his ideas and uh, uh, for many years now. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. My overview, and I'm really mainly impressed by the super low transplant related mortality of only 1% to 3%. That's, I think, almost the perfect platform, right, to um, be for adjuvant immunotherapies after uh, ex vivo T cell depletion. And I think you nicely show that ATG is a great player here. So uh, please, audience, if there are some questions, please drop it in the Q&A box. We have a few, but in the meantime, I would like to um, ask Michael the first question. Um, so you showed and you um, also convinced me that replacing ATG for other agents may be a good way to go. What about the non malignant indications. Do you think it's also safe to replace the ATG there for uh, ABBA and let's say TOSI? Or do you think you need more immune suppression there? Well, uh, uh, honestly, we were much more brave with leukemia. So we, we moved it forward. We first started with a small pilot in uh, refractory leukemia transplanted in active disease. Then in 20 patients, we saw that this is possible and then now confirmed that uh, in a large prospective cohort for uh, non-malignant uh, uh, indications. Honestly, we haven't tried that. We were a little bit more conservative, but uh, uh, there is one thing I should point to is that uh, a lot depends on the brand of ATG. For example, for a while, we were not, not able to use rabbit ATG and the use of uh, horse ATG actually ended up in an excess of severe GVHD, even in the alphabet depleted transplantation. So we have to pay much attention to the type and timing and dose of ATG. So I think that trying this uh, combination, this, this could be tried also in the non-malignant setting. With the caveat we, we, that we have this uh, very unusual for a pediatric transplant uh, setting, bortezomib, which uh, at some point seemed mm. to be an interesting drug to both trying to sensitize leukemia to, to NK cells and mm. also uh, deal with uh, antibody mediated rejection and things like that. So since it was a part of successful recipe, we, we cannot just drop it, but I, I cannot, uh, uh, I'm not sure if it does or does not do any any good for, for the concept. And and just to be clear for the audience, so what ATG are you guys using now, and what is the ATG you use in the, all these? Um, uh, in most of uh, most of the time, we've been using uh, Fresenius is not available or Grafalon is not available in Russia. Okay. So uh, most of the time, we're using Timoglobulin five milligram per kilo a day minus five minus four. Okay, um, one other question. So let me see from the chat box. Uh, Maria, I think this is Maria Gracia. Uh, for Andy, what is the rationale for the initial dose of the CD45RO uh, memory T cell add back? And at what day after transplant? Yeah, so the day um, we kind of asked around, there's a few groups that have been doing this in Singapore, actually in St. Jude's and, uh, and, and Michael's group in Moscow as well. So for the day, we've kind of 
landed on seven because we want to avoid the giving as we're giving ATG and actually I'd like to come back and comment on that uh, later on because I think Michael's data are really really interesting actually uh, yeah. but we will be giving ATG and obviously we don't want to give these uh, potentially viral specific cells and get rid of them you know within hours of giving them so we want the ATG to, to disappear um, and we just felt that day seven would give time for ATG to go, and we will be able to confirm that with the pharmacokinetic studies, hopefully. But you also don't want to leave it too late to let the virus rip through. And you know, I think some of the PID patients are different to the leukemia patients because they often have a much higher uh, viral load when we start. Um, in terms of the dosing, um, I think we wanted to be cautious and not induce GVHD, first of all. Um, so I think what we're trying to do is this kind of balance between not inducing GVHD and demonstrating an effect. Um, and again, I think Michael's demonstrated quite nicely that, you know, the, the, the recipe that you use is probably center specific um, and just taking somebody's recipe off the shelf and trying to use it in your own institution doesn't guarantee success. So I think we're taking a mixture of what people have suggested um, and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. But as I say, there are two phases to the trial. And the first is really a kind of dose finding um, exercise. Um, and also with the ATG, just checking that we're not wiping out the cells as we go. Um, my comment from, from Michael, I mean, I think his data on ATG and immune reconstitution are absolutely fascinating. There was a paper published by the Paris group a few years ago now where they were comparing immune reconstitution in gene therapy patients for X-linked SCID, who'd had a, a, an infusion, versus haploidentical donors who'd also had an infusion, uh, but had received ATG. And what they found was that the immune reconstitution was better in the gene therapy patients than in the haplo patients. And their argument was that um, there may be an allo effect on the thymus, which slowed down immune reconstitution. And that might be partly true, but I think what Michael's definitely shown there is that ATG may have a significant impact on that. And I think th those would be really interesting to debate going forward when we think about immune reconstitution, particularly in the PID patients. And okay. what ATG are you using, Andy? Naofi? We, we're using Fresnius. We're using Fresnius. Okay. Fresnius, yeah. Okay. Okay, next question. Um, Michael, what is the explanation for the lack of effects on relapse in the DLI group? Also, Maria. <laughs> I, I wish I knew that. Uh, well, for the DLI group, uh, I, I, well, for the DLI group, I think that the explanation is clear. Memory T cells have very uh, low L reactivity. So, uh, and uh, the, 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 the this low doses with low L reactivity just cannot produce the, the GVL we expect. For me, the question is why uh, the, the whole platform of alphabetic G cell depletion was kind of ideologically based on providing high doses of NK cells and gamma delta T cells. And uh, honestly, we thought that uh, avoiding ATG would create kind of a mm -hmm. perfect condition for NK cells and gamma delta T cells to work. So. Uh, I'm kind of disappointed by the fact that we don't see any indication that uh, emitting ATG improves, although this is retrospective comparison, but I think that the number of patients high enough to, to see the trends and there is no trend towards better control of leukemia. So, and there are a lot of thoughts. Uh, I would be happy to, to have feedback from the uh, faculty on, on this fact. I think you also have to realize that if you reduce your non relapse mortality, which is a competing event, um, Maybe, yeah. you may increase your relapse as well, because you have 10, 15% who does not die yeah. because of the okay. procedure. So I think you also have to consider the competing event. Um, we have another seven minutes. Susan from uh, Robertson. In the patients who do not achieve CD4 immune reconstitution by day 100, is there an impact of the post transplant steroids? Yeah, it's a great question. We've looked at this in the setting of T cell depletion, although not, um, not with the milestone um, analysis that we're doing that now. But 
but in patients with T-cell depletion who develop GVHD and get steroids for that reason, or having Grafman syndrome and get steroids for that reason, the T-cell reconstitution is even slower. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I have another question for Andy, and please keep it short because we have only have five minutes left. So you showed that the patients with uh, active infections do worse. Over the last decade, we also have newborn screening. So is the number of the let's say, patients that go into um, transplant with an active infection lower compared to 10, 15 years ago? And may this also explain the better outcomes over the last couple of years? So, I mean, there's a number of answers to that. First of all, in the UK, we only started newborn screening about a month ago. Um, so we're quite a way behind that curve. Uh, and it will be interesting to see what effects that has on infection. And I'm sure, as other centres have shown, that our incidence of infection in skid will fall. The big impact, of course, is actually not in the skid patients, because... Um, the, the the survival in those patients is actually very good uh, and it may be an, it may be a combination not only of viral infection but also organ damage that we see in the older patients and i don't think that newborn screening as it stands at the moment is going to have a huge impact on that i know we pick up some i mean for instance doc eights and nymagen breakage and things for instance but i think there'll still be a lot of um, non-skid combined immune deficiency that we don't pick up under the current screening programs and so I think that that is likely to be an ongoing problem for some time. I think in the skid we will see a fall in the number of infections but I, I don't think it will significantly impact our results because they're already pretty good. Hope that's quick enough. Yes it is. Uh, okay Alicia, hands up. Ray. Thank you. So first of all, really fantastic session. Thanks so much to the three speakers and uh, to you, uh, Yap. Um, Andy, I have a question for you about the non-skilled PID, non PID and specifically HLH. When I have to transplant an HLH with a T-cell depleted approach, I'm always very scared about the risk of primary graft failure. So I was wondering what's your magic recipe for that? And second is a question for uh, the three of you. Uh, in my experience, despite the rate of the viral reactivation is high, about 50% for CMV across studies, we don't have so many issues in country of organ disease and the, uh, the, the need of cell therapy for treating organ disease is limited to a very small proportion of patients. So I, I would like you guys to comment uh, on that too. So I'll go first on the HLH. I mean, we do see graft failure, not only in HLH, but also in other primary immunodeficiencies as well. Um, and I'm not sure what the cause of that is. Um, I think there's a disease specific effect. Um, there may be an effect actually of the conditioning. Um, and, you know, whilst I think triosulfan is uh, less toxic than busulfan, even when we do um, targeted busulfan, I think there's increasing evidence that it may be slightly less myeloablative. Um, and so for HLH, we would certainly add thiotipa. Um, but I, I think it is an issue that we see, um, and we do need to retransplant some of these patients. But generally, our retransplant results have been very good when we've had to do it. Um, and I think it, it's kind of it's a balance, isn't it? You give a slightly more toxic chemo regimen and you might get better engraftment overall, um, but there's a price to pay for that. You give a slightly less toxic regimen and you might see a little bit more graft failure, but you don't get the toxicities associated with it. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's no free lunch. And the other question from maybe uh, uh, for our experience with, uh, I think uh, it is different for, for leukemia and uh, primary immune deficiency because for leukemia patients, most in most cases, we have uh, nice, con we take control of CNV and don't have real CNV disease. But in primary immune deficiency, uh, since many of the patients already have maybe kind of tissue infections, we have some problems with retinitis and 
I would say that we see the most common scenario is non-severe GVHD when you still have to give steroids and then you have real problem mm -hmm. controlling. So we, we don't use uh, virus specific cells to treat infections too often. This is a rare occasion and I don't think it, that, that that's the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And um, about CMV reactivations, it may also be important what you consider a CMV reactivation. What is the, let's say, definition? So you showed no impact, but you showed an impact on the more specific um, responses. So what is a CMV reactivation? Is that any loads or we is are, it- we are, Yeah, we are very sensitive. We actually in the Haplos setting, we kind of treat any anything above 500 copies per, uh, per ml. So it's a low threshold for therapy and for considering this uh, clinical significant. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and the duration of treatment, was it, let's say, different in the two groups? So the number of reactivations is the same, but the, uh, mm -hmm. also the, the um, antiviral well, treatment was uh, the same. Uh, uh, since we measure viruses once a week, actually, so we can calculate okay. on the weeks, but not days. So we're not sensitive okay. enough to, to measure the dif this difference. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. I think with this, we let's come to the end of this uh, fabulous session. Uh, I think it was really cool to, let's say, talk about immune reconstitution and the uh, major advantage, uh, advantages that has been made over the last couple of years. So again, thanks to the three speakers, thanks to the audience, and um, see you in the next session. And thank you, David. Thanks. Nice to meet you so face. Thank to meet you. up in person. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That was fantastic. <laughs>